Welcome everybody to Graceway Baptist Church on Capitol Hill. I'm Pastor Brad Wells and it is a privilege to be with you and to be celebrating our nine year anniversary right here at the Hill Center, right on the crest of Capitol Hill. All these years presenting the gospel, presenting the way of truth, the incredible words of life, and our theme for this year as we launch with God, all things are possible. Now, all things are possible because of God and the thrust of our, of our existence, the thrust of everything we will focus on is getting closer to God. And I wanna challenge you today, make a decision. I need to get closer to Christ. Let's stand by worshiping the Lord in song and praise and, and then I'll present to you our theme, Exodus chapter 33, in just a minute. And let's sing Forever God is Faithful. Today is our anniversary Sunday here at Graceway Baptist Church, and I want to welcome you in. We are thanking the Lord for His faithfulness through all these years, and so sing it out from your heart. Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His mercy endureth forever, for he is good, he is above all things. His mercy endureth forever. Sing praise, sing praise. The mighty hand and outstretched arm, his mercy endureth forever. For the life that's been reborn, his mercy
second verse, he took my sins and my sorrows. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them real. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, oh, Grace Away, thank you so much for being here today. It is a blessing to see you. We have a thriving online ministry, so if you're online, thanks for being here as well. Quick announcement, these Bibles have been left out front for the last couple of weeks. If they are yours, they're going to be sitting right up here at the end of the service. Please grab them. If you're online for some reason, you've left the country and these are yours, then let us know and we'll find a way to get them to you. I hope your new year has been great. One of the things that I have told myself this year that I'm going to do more is every single day I get up in the morning and I tell my family that I'm going to go jogging, and then I don't. It's become a running joke. Uh, that is a joke. Indulging me. All right, take a look at your bulletin, please. Um, there are some important announcements on here. Of course, this is the start of a new theme for our church with God, and I am so excited to see with God and for God, how we can do the impossible as a church family this year. We do have missionaries, as I said, on the back is a list of our missionaries. We need to be praying specifically this week. The makes, we do have the junior makes here with us on deputation. Um, their mom and dad, as they grew up in the mission field there on Ivory Coast, are asking us specifically to pray for their Bible Institute so that they can create more leaders that can start churches there in the Ivory Coast. So please pray for that. We have church services on Thursday evening as our midweek. We had about 35 people there last night praying for our country at the Supreme Court like we do every Saturday night at 7 o'clock. So please join us if you've never done so. Even when it's really cold and dark like last night, we are there praying for our nation and for our leaders. And then, of course, you're here on Sunday. Some specific things that are coming up this week. Snow camp starts um, this week, so please get with Tori if you're interested in that. And a young person. Please make your way to Cameron Hubbard's place uh, tomorrow for game night if you're interested. March for Life is this week, so please join us for that. Uh, to, uh, not Tori. Um, Worth is in charge there. And then there's something cryptic at the bottom. AMM is the annual members meeting. Um, that's normally on the first uh, Sunday in February, but because of some scheduling challenges with this building, we need to vote about doing so two weeks later. And so on Thursday, we'll vote for that. That's what all of that means. But either way, we're overjoyed that you're here. I so look forward to hearing from our pastor about his vision for this year with God doing the possible and doing the impossible for and with him. Tori, back to you. Thank you very much, and let's all stand together. I'm going to focus our attention to the Lord that we serve, the, the King of the universe, and it's a privilege to come and to have access to his throne room every single day and to pray. And so we're going to sing this song, Bow the Knee. I want you to sing from your heart, and uh, yeah, let's play the intro.
have one more song to sing together, but before we do, we just sang about prayer, and so I want the music to keep playing here, and we'll just take a few minutes, try to eliminate the distractions in our mind, and go to the Lord in prayer, and ask for Him to speak to us today. Thank you so much for the day you've given to us, a brand new day to serve you. Thank you for life. Thank you for breath. And I pray we would not take this day for granted and realize it's a gift from you. Uh, I pray that, that as we come to you and we mingle with other Christians, that we would be able to eliminate those distractions in our, in our mind that are pulling us this way and that way, and we would focus in on what you have for us today. And... Uh, pastor's going to come up and, and open the word and preach, and I pray that we would focus in on what you want us to know, what you have to tell us today. And it's your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Our last song together we'll sing, Behold Our God. And there's a lot of questions here. Who has held the oceans in his hand all the way through? We all know it's just our God. And we're going to sing nice and loud, Come Let Us Adore Him. Let's play that again.
thanks for singing that song with me. You may be seated. And Pastor, come preach to us at this time. Amen. Praise the Lord. What a, what a song. I was in the back there uh, singing and worshiping the Lord, and I was watching you guys worship the Lord and uh, looking over into the other room and people singing and praising God. You know, that's why we were created, to worship the Lord and be brought into His presence. Well, today is our nine-year anniversary, and the Lord has uh, allowed us to serve Him here on Capitol Hill for these nine years. And I want to, uh, I want to tell you the story that we call the Grace Way. That's the name of our church, the Grace Way. And it comes from a verse of Scripture in uh, Exodus, and I'll get to that in just a second. But our story really begins March 2nd, 2013, on a Saturday night, about 10 p.m. or so, and I was flat on my face on the floor of my office at the radio station in Mount Hagen, Papua New Guinea. Uh, my wife and kids had been there with me. We had been serving the Lord for about 17 years. And I began to pray, Lord, uh, if you're calling me to go, I'll go. And if you're calling me to stay, I'll stay. Just say the word. Now, this prayer was not new. Uh, we had prayed it back in 1995, my last year of Bible school. And God had answered clearly. Deborah and I began our journey to the jungles of New Guinea there in 1997. But this time, it would be different. We would be leaving a great work that God had done and put together there in New Guinea. It was an incredible opportunity. The mission field there was the dream of my life. And we would be walking into something here in D.C. seemingly impossible utterly ominous at least in my mind it would be like trying to walk on water with a family of nine so <laughs> and the weight of the decision demanded crystal clear perfect peace and uh, undeniable direction from the lord and peace did come that night not clarity not a call but the calm that comes in letting go of selfish ambition ulterior motives and a shallow understanding before uh, an almighty, all-wise, all-loving, never-changing creator. Now, there had been this stirring for some time, perhaps even about two years. Papua New Guinea mandated, mandated, like many other governments, that children leave the nation at about the age of 18. And that is to... Um, make sure that the missionaries empower the local people and really work themselves out of a job. And I really enjoyed that, uh, agreed with that uh, decision. But that would mean that for six years in a row, we would have one child leaving uh, the nation and returning to the, to the States at 18. And Deborah and I believed it was our privilege and priority to help them transition back into the states and we prayed earnestly for god to show us uh, how he wanted us to do that uh, to our children there in uh, papua new guinea um, had infused themselves into the church and the church was blooming and blossoming it was showing great signs of uh, indigenization and god had given to me a timothy in Leslie Daniels. Now, at the beginning, he was an unlikely prospect, he, kind of a, a wild-looking guy, and uh, uh, the Lord had really um, brought him uh, close together. I had interviewed him for a position at the radio station, and uh, he agreed to um, uh, cover the sports at, uh, at our, our, our radio station. Two years later, after that, radio... Uh, Leslie repented of his sin and was born again and baptized there in the Rongan River. Leslie later married Betty, a young lady my wife had met at the bakery and invited to our home for discipleship. And Les and Betty had their ups and downs, but they 
grew into great leadership at our church. In fact, Leslie would be launching a new series on the book of Jonah in our adult Sunday school class the morning after I had been praying there in my office on my face. And it was becoming obvious. The church wanted to take the lead in reaching their community for Christ. If I continued as pastor there in that mission church, I would be inhibiting him or causing other people to depend upon gifts from the United States of America and inhibiting their spiritual maturity. Now, not only was there a stirring in our circumstances, there had also been a concern for our country, the United States of America. You see, 2013, our nation was decidedly turning away from biblical morality. The more I researched the effect of the church in the U.S., the more astonished I had become. Americans were turning away from God and the God of their fathers and heading into apostasy at breakneck speed. America had changed its course and set its face to rewriting what is right and wrong. My heart was greatly burdened and I began to pray earnestly and intently for the pastors in our homeland. As I did, the stirring became more insistent. God did want me to be a preacher. But did God want me to leave my beloved mission field, Papua New Guinea, and go back to the very people that had sent me here in the United States? So I perned, uh, pulled out the uh, Rand McNally Atlas. How many of you know what a Rand McNally Atlas is? Okay, I love those things. That I had purchased on our last furlough, and I began to pray over the cities of America. Seattle, the largest city close to my home church in Idaho, I had a great burden for that. Portland, also nearby and in need of some churches. Los Angeles, I was born in L.A. and uh, the great city of entertainment. New York, uh, my wife had had some sort of some uh, connections back to New York. Her father had pastored there at the beginning of their ministry. And so I began to seek counsel. First from my pastor, uh, Rick DeMichael in Boise, Idaho, and then from my dad and other pastors and godly mentors and friends. And by the way, you need godly mentors in your life. Don't just ask your friends. Don't just ask your peers. Ask the generation ahead of you. And ask, uh, ask your parents. Ask your pastors. You'll get uh, godly wisdom. I even asked um, an evangelist that had been visiting us in New Guinea, preaching for me, uh, a tent revival. And I showed him the Rand McNally uh, map index, and I showed him Seattle, and I was talking about this, and I had a bunch of statistics, and he grabbed it and turned the page. He says, you're one page off, and pointed to Washington, D.C. He said, pray about that city. If there's a city that needs a church, it's that one. I agreed, but with a bit of a chuckle. And I kept my promise, and I started Googling churches in the D.C. area, I found a, a Pastor Philip Bishop in Alexandria and um, at Lighthouse Baptist Church, and he began to answer a few of my questions, but went silent and didn't answer for about two weeks. And honestly, to a little bit of my relief, I was like, okay, God doesn't want me to go to D.C. It, it must be something else. And um, I knew God would, would lead eventually. And all this culminated to that Saturday night, praying there on the floor on my face, March the 2nd. And after complete submission to God, God's will and God's timing, I went to bed with that perfect peace. March 3rd, Sunday morning arose. I woke with a renewed burden. I knelt beside my bed on this little sheepskin prayer rug that I've been using, and I was trying to get my heart ready to preach in a couple of hours. But the burden for America just increased. Finally, I lifted my hands up toward heaven. I said, God, I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere. But just send me, just call me. Send me a sign. And as I said that last word, my phone indicated that an email had arrived. Incredible awe washed over me as I grabbed up my phone and ran out to the kitchen where my family was. And they were preparing a Sunday morning breakfast. And I said, God has 
the answer for us. And I opened the messages, and no surprise, I knew it was there, an email from Pastor Bishop. And he said, sorry for the delay in response. This is what he said. Inside the Beltway, churches are dying or closing and are merging on a regular basis. It's not because of a lack of people. And he said this, jump in, the water is great. Claim as your motto, be not weary in well-doing, in due season we shall reap if we faint not. I thought the water is great. What an odd way to say it. Though the kids heard the excitement in uh, my voice, my wife and I understood this would mean a complete change in direction for sure. We walked to church in great sobriety. God had answered, but what did he mean exactly? A song was sung, the announcements were given there at church, and Brother Les stood up and began teaching there from the book of Jonah. Turn in your Bibles, Jonah chapter 1, read verse 1. And then he came to verse number 2, and it was as if heaven thundered the words, Arise, go, cry against that great city, Nineveh, for their wickedness is come up before me. My wife was sitting there a few rows back. I was sitting on the bench over here behind the teacher and uh, the preacher. And, and she looked down at the marginal note. And uh, her Bible said, Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. The capital. And that's as far as she got. And she looked up at me. I felt the, the, the pressure and the presence of everyone staring at me. I just thought everybody was like, Get up and go. You just heard the Lord direct you. What are you waiting for? A whale or something? Come on, let's go. But it was only my wife that was looking at me, and we both knew, my sheep hear my voice. And we had heard. It was the next day I told Brother Les, and I knew he would soon be the pastor of this church. And God had called us. We did not know uh, uh, exactly what we were supposed to do in Washington, D.C., but we knew. Leslie quoted some words from a song, God will make a way when there seems to be no way. Five days after the initial call, God confirmed once again in my devotions from Proverbs chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. It was the eighth day there. Doth not wisdom cry, Well, that's what I had been wrestling with. Go cry against the great city. What do I get? One of those sandwich boards and a bullhorn. And I think those guys were already there. But what do you want me to do? I'm willing to do whatever you want. But what is it? Doth not wisdom cry. And understanding put forth her voice. She standeth in the top of high places like a hill. By the way, in the places of the paths, she crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in of the doors. Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. With trepidation, I called my pastor back, and he replied, I've been praying for 50 men to go to D.C. and preach. Now I'm praying for 49. Yeah, I called my dad. He said, son, when God calls in such a clear way, you go. I called the man that had invested the most in our radio station, my good friend and colleague, Gene Sharp. And with excitement, he shouted (laughs) into the phone. He said, I was just at a meeting, Awake America, and we were on our faces praying, begging God for a preacher and for a church right here in D.C. and on Capitol Hill. And he said, you are the answer to our prayer. I wasn't sure about all of these things. I mean, it's all coming in as a flood. I don't know. Well, God directed us to set our departure date for July 7th, 2014. That was about 15 months after our initial calling. This gave us time to prepare the people and lead the multifaceted ministry that we had worked together to build. In that time, Deborah and I took a survey trip to D.C. And honestly, when we arrived, I thought the families would be waiting for us, just almost like at the, at the airport. and Like, oh, you're here, okay. But they weren't there. And I bought a Metro card and went to all 86 stops 
That's how many there were in 2013 and prayed. Um, getting out, walking around the neighborhoods, that's a, it was a big chore. Where did God want us? Where did God want us? I remember when I got off here in Eastern Market and I crossed the street on the north side of Pennsylvania and um, walked over to uh, 8th Street and I wrote a little note. This is the area. This is the area. There's something here. It was, it, was a, it was a drawing, a leading from the Lord. We um, returned to our work in Papua New Guinea with, with not a lot of clear direction. The next few months, I drew diamond shapes everywhere. My family wearied of hearing about real estate prices and the layout of D.C.'s communities and this city's over here and drawing the clock face, this is here, all that stuff. But when I wasn't talking about, God was presenting it. It was in conversations, in movies, and other missionaries. D.C. seemed to be everywhere. In fact, my wife was asked to host a uh, town hall for the U.S. ambassador and the entire embassy, 19 people from D.C., came and uh, did a little town hall with the U.S. citizens there in our little tiny community of Mount Hagen. So after months of preparation and many agonizing goodbyes, we arrived at the Reagan National on July 12, 2014. It was swampy and oppressively hot. We stood on the sidewalk. I could take you to the very stop. Not... Not, very spot, not far from the uh, Ronald Reagan statue, with our nine suitcases, our two guitars, and one laptop computer. No one was there to meet us. I hired, hired a large van to take us to our two-day stay at the Residence Inn in Alexandria. That's really all the planning we had. We rented a small car for the next couple days. We had, had to take two trips in our car to go to church or to go anywhere. And then we started on housing in D.C. How many of you played that game? How about affordable housing in D.C.? Okay. And uh, that Sunday night, uh, just a day after we arrived, my wife and I went and knelt in the driveway of our, neck of our new rental house. And uh, by that Wednesday, we had moved in. See, you got to understand, we had arrived with expired driver's licenses, no rental history, no car, no furniture, and we certainly looked out of place. But we were in that house by Wednesday. Just another miracle from the Lord. Now, we had been direct, directed by our pastor in Idaho to join the Independent Baptist Church of Clinton, Maryland. And their ministry, Awake America, would give us good, solid direction on reaching Capitol Hill in D.C., it was at this point, uh, we still didn't know why God had called us here. We just knew that we were called. Many of the churches that had been supporting us there in New Guinea were now supporting us through this uh, venture in faith, no matter what it was. And it was like walking on water financially, month to month. There is a difference from between the economy in Papua New Guinea and D.C. Surprise, surprise. And um, we joined the church there our second week in, uh, in, in the city. And I asked Pastor Creed, what is the best way to cry against the city? And he said, start a church. And when he said that, God said amen in my heart. It was just like, this is the direction that you've got to take. And honestly, I don't know that I could have known the will of God without these key people. See, God put part of the puzzle here, part of the puzzle here. We had to join the church. I had to submit. I had to listen. I had to get advice. And all these elements were essential. God didn't just give me the whole download. It was in all these different places. And that's how God works. We chose January 11th, 2015, as our start date. But since it was only August at this point, we bought a Frisbee and a football. That's a good thing to buy. And went to the park and I uh, said, hey, kids, let's start a church. I just was talking to them this morning. They were like, Dad, 
we were terrified. We were like, how do you start a church with a Frisbee and a football? What in the world? <laughs> Our, my friend Gene Sharp came to help us make an introductory video and kind of get some things in place. And we held our very first service on the Capitol lawn on a Wednesday night. That's actually when we started our first service there in the month of August. I visited hotels. I was looking for a place to, to lease. I stopped at Eastern Market across the street. Um, and there was, a, there was a room that they would lease. But um, when I... I sent a picture of it to my, to my wife. She called. They said, no, but check it, Hill Center. I came over and looked at this. It's so big and so nice, and they had a, uh, some, uh, some very big events. I was like, there's no way. We're never going to get in here. Then I looked at the, heart, the art, and I was like, oh, okay, there's no way. It's never going to happen. <laughs> but uh, Deborah set up an appointment for us. We came and looked, and Frank Robinson uh, was there that day, and Hill Center agreed to give us a chance and uh, made us a, a contract. And we didn't have the money for it, but we signed it. And we jumped in, and God blessed every step of the way. And our preparation began in earnest. What should we call the, city, the, the church? Capital city, federal city, national city. And we knew that God's grace had been empowering us the whole way. And so we wanted to call it Grace Baptist Church. But according to Google, um, that name was already taken. And it wasn't until later that we found out that it had already folded and become Grace Condominiums. It's that beautiful 1800s building across the street. But we began a word study of grace through the Bible. It was grace that made Jesus leave his riches and become poor so that through his poverty we might be rich. It was grace that saves us uh, through redemption in Christ Jesus. Grace abounds toward us that we might abound in every good work. Grace perfects his strength in our weakness. Grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. It's grace that allows His power to work effectually both in and through us. Grace helps us, grace helps us preach the unsearchable riches of Christ to the lost. And it's grace that we need. And then we came to Exodus chapter 33 and verse number 13, where Moses says, God, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way. And that was it. Grace way. Grace that is God's presence and power to walk His way. And um, the Independent Baptist Church of Clinton, Maryland uh, commissioned the starting of Grace Way Baptist Church of Capitol Hill on a cold Sunday morning, January 11th, 2015. And things are just beginning. Because we're not walking by our own design, our own plans. This is not something done with uh, our own hands. It is the grace of God. And this year, we're going to see something even more powerful, something even more amazing. I'd like to call up my family here at this time. And uh, we're going to sing a song for you right here in the middle of the message. Would that be okay, Brother Tom? Sure. It's all right. So we got Tom's permission, so we're good. Um, it's the impossible things that God works through. Now, the possible does belong to us. And God actually has already empowered us to do the possible with either mental or physical uh, ability. But it's the impossible that belongs with God. And God wants to do something impossible through you. And God can do anything. God can do anything. Turn to your neighbor and say, God can do anything. Uh, to do anything. All right. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is our family, and uh, all of these uh, soldiers are uh, just incredible workers in the ministry of the Lord. And Deborah and I couldn't be more proud of them.
Praise God. Jennifer was laughing there because uh, uh, last <laughs> service we forgot that, to say that, and then she forgets every time. Anyways, so would you stand up with, for just a second with me here and uh, turn in your Bible, if you would, to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. I hope you like that presentation. Was that okay? Amen. All right, good. Exodus chapter 33. And I want you to really dial in to verse number 13. I want you to claim it as yours. Exodus 33. Man, verse number 13. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I might know thee that I might find grace in thy sight and consider that this nation is thy people. I believe as a church, this is our verse. And I want you to see why. See, this is a prayer. Now, therefore, I pray thee. This is Moses praying to God. I'm praying. If I've found grace in your sight. And now, grace is empowerment. It's not just tolerance. It's empowerment. Grace is the favor of God, the smile of heaven. If I've found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way. You see those two words? Grace way. And that is what just, just etched itself in my heart and in my mind. The reason why is that I might know thee. The whole idea is God is saying it's not because you're smarter or you're richer or you're, you've got a better education or you've got this, this or that. All these things. We've got all these things. It's saying, Moses is saying, I want to know you. And God is saying, I want to bless you with my presence. And that's what God wants to do with you today. I'd like to pray and then we can be seated. Father, we ask for your blessing now upon this short little message. I pray that your word would burst alive in our hearts. Lord, that we could hear your call, that we would not be confused. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Now, a growing relationship needs at least three investments per week to thrive. It's free marital advice. You need three good conversations, texts, phone calls, dates, whatever it is. You need three. If you don't have those three, um, it's going to be a struggle. Um, uh, President Adams used to write to his wife, and he would write. Uh, my wife and I were, uh, when we were uh, engaged, uh, we were separated for three months but we would write a letter every single day. I would write to her, and she'd write to me every single day. And that was, that was the way we continued to advance. You will, your relationship will stagnate as, uh, for lack of an investment. So keep investing. Now, it's not just spending money or uh, going and uh, you know, eating a good meal. That's not necessarily the investment you need. What you need is to find agreement. You need to find agreement in your rules, your roles, and your common goals. When you find that agreement, you begin to advance. Now, my wife and I, we've been married these 28 years. And I'll tell you, this year, we've got to, those three investments. We've got to keep finding those same rules, those same common goals. Up, a little to the left, up, a little bit to the right. We've got to keep working on it. And that is relationship relationship is how am i in relation to you you're over here i'm over here okay i can come here but i can't go there i see it this way and there's sometimes a little bit of a struggle not all of these investments are just smooth and you know eating chocolate sundaes or something man some of them are like no i don't see it that way and, and that's not a bad investment that can be a good investment because you are aligning yourselves now, this is what Moses is doing with God. Moses sees things differently. Now, you've got to be careful because you don't want to be arguing with God, demanding that God sees things your way. But God is willing to meet us, and God is willing to listen to an honest heart and an honest argument. 
Psalm 103 in verse number 7 says something very interesting. He, that is God, made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. Now there's a big difference here. The children of Israel would never be going into the promised land. You remember they would wander in the desert. Moses would come right up to the brink and Joshua would bring his people in. Joshua and Caleb would be the only two of that generation to enter in. But God revealed something about himself greater than the rest of the people. That's what we need to dial into, and that's what I'm anticipating showing you right now. See, there's two levels to the knowledge of God. The first level is God's works, or God's creation, or as in this verse, His acts. The Bible says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Everybody that's honest can see these acts, these deeds. We're talking about the children of Israel here. They had seen God part the Red Sea. They had seen God deliver them out of the hand of Egypt. But they didn't know God's ways. What is God's ways? Well, that's above creation. That is the character of God. This is that higher level. This is what God thinks. This is what God does. And I submit to you, if you don't know God's ways or God's character, God's acts or His works will begin to frustrate you. You'll be like, why did God do that? Why did God do this? It seems like God should have done that. And that's where we must learn God's ways. And that's what's called the grace way, the way of grace. Now, don't get the wrong definition of grace being tolerance. That's not correct. God's definition of, of grace is empowerment, enablement, uh, His blessing. Now, I want to give you three quick points. Number one, God's way or God's presence will give you affinity. Growing affinity. Point one, growing affinity. And affinity simply is, the, is a word meaning friendship or, or favor. It means likeness or clo closeness. There's a growing affinity. Now, I want to show it to you here in verse number 11. So we're in verse 13, back up a couple verses to verse number 11. Exodus 33 and 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses, how? Face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again unto the camp. God is interacting with Moses like a friend. Affinity. See, with God's presence comes his friendship. And he has promised never to leave us, never to leave us alone. When you're on God's grace way, when you're on God's path, it is a growing affinity. We must grow in likeness to Christ. Now, here's the danger. The danger is self-expression. The danger is to focus on how I feel and how I think. And our culture is embracing this right now. A generation, two generations, three generations ago, mothers and, and fathers would say, no, no. That's not allowed. That's not correct. And then they would physically stop children from doing this or expressing this. That's no. This is how we are. This. Maybe they went overboard. Maybe they didn't. That's not the point. Here's the point. There are two major ideas. One, discipline, and this is the way it's supposed to be. The other is just do whatever you want. This is how I feel at this time. Now, Parents, I want to encourage you. One of your chief jobs is to teach children to deny themselves. To deny themselves. That is the foundation of discipline. I want this. I will deny myself, and so I won't, I won't have it. So at the beginning, you'll have all these rules. 
truckloads of rules. But as they grow, you have less and less and less and less until they know your way. There's actually no rule. Can I borrow the car? Of course, here it is. And no rules? No rules because they know your way. This is what I do. This is what I expect. This is called maturity. Now, don't treat a little tiny kid with no maturity and no self-discipline and a strong will as if they are mature. And you know my way, just do it my way. They're not going to do it your way. They're going to do it their way. And that's what those rules and that's what discipline is for. And we need self-discipline. Maturity is I don't need external discipline. I have self-discipline. And we become more and more like our parents, more and more like acceptable members of society. Or in this case, we're talking about, about God and Graceway. We become more and more like our Creator. This is God's goal and God's desire is maturity, becoming more and more like God. So God's grace is a growing affinity. Verse number 11. Now, I want you to jump over to verse number 12. Verse number 12 shows us our next little thing. God's grace is eventual clarity. Affinity and now clarity. Now Moses had a problem. And it was similar to the problems that we have. We know a little bit about what God wants, but not everything. It's kind of murky. It's kind of unclear. And Moses brings this before God. And Moses said unto the Lord, See... Thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know. God, I don't know. You haven't let me know whom thou will send with me. Where's my help? Where's my abilities? You know, that's the truth with every great calling of God. God's call comes to somebody and you don't have the resources, you don't have the skills, you don't have the experience, you don't have the network, you don't have the net worth, you don't have the something. And you know it's essential. And all the planning and all the scheming isn't going to get you over that mountain. You need that. God knows that. I mean, if we know it, God knows it. And Moses says, Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name. See, Moses had the right formula in his head. He just wasn't coming to the right answer. He saw the equation, but he didn't get it. It's simply God saying, Moses, you don't need to know all this other stuff. God's saying, I know you, and you know me. In other words, it's the presence of God. You need proximity to God. You need to get close to Him. And when you do, His grace is enough. <laughs> I know thee by name, and thou hast found grace in my sight. And God is saying, that's, that's all you need, the grace. Now, for, for Deborah and I, God showed us in Jonah chapter 1, verse number 2, Arise, go, and cry. Wow. It just seemed so big, so general. Then God made it a little bit more clear. Five days later, doth not wisdom cry. Ah! So there's, there's a, an appropriate uh, answer for every problem. And, and we need to uh, present each one of those in an, an intelligent way to these very specific situations. And then God used pastor creed and god used my pastor over there and god used uh my dad uh, and god used all these different mentors and everybody had a little piece of the puzzle now i'll tell you what if i would have just said god told me something i know i would miss out on all these things god often does that just in nature he puts this mineral over here and that mineral over here and the water's over here and and the sun's over there and Living things have to adapt. And living things have to reach their roots over here and reach their leaves over here. And that's what you're going to have to do. You can't just be proud and um, self-sufficient. 
So, number one, God's grace way is a growing affinity. That is, likeness toward God. And eventual clarity. It gets clearer and clearer every day. The will of God is like the sunrise. It, it gets brighter and brighter and brighter every minute. Let me give you the third thought. And it's found in verse number 14. It is peaceful tranquility. Verse 14 is very short. And he said, that is God said, my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee what? Rest. You know, we live in a time where people are hurry, scurry, and worry and are running everywhere. And right now, as you're sitting here, I hate to distract you, you've probably got 10 emails that should be written. You've probably got a few calls that need to be taken care of. You've probably got this other thing pressing on you. And you really would rather go do this other thing. And the greatest thing we need is rest. It's rest. I was reading a statistic that uh, more and more, a greater and greater percentage, I forget what the percentage was, but that doesn't matter, a greater and greater percentage of people, instead of going to some incredible vacation, and they named several cool places that we'd all like to go, would rather just stay home and not have to do anything. You know what we need? We need rest. We need a break. Where do I get this rest? Where, I, where do I get restored? Where do I feel whole again? Where do I feel right again? I'll tell you, it's in proximity to your Creator. You've got to get back to God. You've got to get back with your Creator. Let me show you this verse in Hebrews chapter 3. Now, Hebrews chapter 3 is kind of the summary of Exodus 33. Verses 7 through 11 say this. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. Verse 9. Uh, when your fathers, here it is, tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. So this is the children of Israel. 40 years they saw his works. This is exactly what I presented earlier. Ways versus works. They saw his works 40 years. And look at verse number 10. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart and they have not known my what? In other words, just knowing about what I did, my works, is not a substitute for knowing me. And if I said to my wife, uh, positive things. I knew what she did. Thank you for this dinner. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. Thank you for, thank you for writing my sermon. Oh, <laughs> uh, thank you for whatever she did. She, and I say thank you, thank you, thank you. But I don't know her heart. She's gonna feel like you don't care about me at all. And I just did this list of all these things I'm thankful for, and she still feels isolated. And that's exactly what God is saying. Knowing my works is no substitute for knowing my way. Now the next verse is kind of kind of a little scary. Because what happened? Look at verse number 11. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. That's our third point. Tranquility. Rest. In, in other words... Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 11 says, If all you know about God is His works, 1, 2, 3, 4, A, B, C, D, and all these things, and, and you've got a great memory, and you know it, and you could pass the test. But you don't know His character. You don't know His way. You spend no time with Him. You're not searching for the Lord. It's an insult to Him. And... You won't enter into his rest. I submit to you that many a Christian, many a Christian has not entered into the rest of God. And the rest that I'm talking about here is not like the day of rest, like the seventh day, the Sabbath. This rest is a 365-day rest. This is like the millennium. This is with God. 
And that is the whole story of the Messiah. The Messiah, the promised Messiah, is to come and bring peace and to bring rest to our hearts and to our souls. So, in human relationship, you've got to meet somebody to get to know them, to get to trust them, and maybe you might love them, and then maybe obey them. And that is how relationship goes. Why would you do that? You don't want to do that. I do because I love them. I don't necessarily want to do this, but I'm going to do it because I love them. And that's relationship. And that's the way it is with God. See, there will be no rest until you can get into the presence of your maker. Now, I know how we think. We all think the same way. Well, I can observe it. I know this guy. I can observe by observation. I can learn this stuff. Or I can get in there and ask some sharp questions by interrogation. I am going to be able to figure this thing out. Or, I mean, this is the day of education. We can take a class. I can read a book. I can read some reports and some summaries. I can listen to a podcast. I can get it. It's not by education. Listen, the Word of God, the presence of God is by revelation. God will reveal Himself to you and make Himself known. Isaiah declares in chapter 55 in verse 8, My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my, what? Ways. Your ways, saith the Lord. God's saying, this is where I am. It's the right way. I want you to think this way. So Christian maturity is becoming more and more like God. That's affinity. It's the will of God becoming clearer and clearer every day. And there's a tranquility, there's a rest that happens, even as I enter more into impossible things, because God's doing it. You know you're working with God when you feel that propelling feeling. It's something God's doing. I'm not really a great surfer. I love surfing. I love surfing. My dad's a great surfer. Um, but surfing is a lot of work. You get out there, and I mean, you are paddling on that board. It is exhausting. I was very surprised when Dad taught me how to surf. It is exhausting. But something wonderful happens when you are paddling in the same direction as that wave. And then all of a sudden, that wave just gets under you and picks you up. And you start sliding down the face of the wave. It's an amazing thing. And that's what I'm talking about. When you start paddling with God, it's not that your paddling starts working. No. All of a sudden, you don't need to paddle. <laughs> the, the power of God, your Creator, just picks you up. And you're like, wow, something wonderful is happening here that I don't even know about. Psalm 67, verses 1 through 3 says, God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause His face to shine upon us. That's the description of grace. Verse 2, That thy way may be known upon the earth, thy saving health among all nations. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. You see, there is no promised Canaan without your Creator. The blessing of God without the blesser is a cheap substitute. You need God. I need God. We need God more than we need all the stuff God can give. And God is not finished with you. I'm going to ask you to repeat this to your neighbor, so pay attention. God is not finished with you until your chief desire is God alone. God is not finished with you until your chief desire is God alone. Would you say that to your neighbor real quick? God is not finished with you until your chief desire is God alone. Yeah. 
Why did God bring His people to Egypt? He knew they would be enslaved. Why did God bring them to the Red Sea? They couldn't cross it. Why did God bring them to the dry desert? And the answer to each one of these questions is so that they would turn to Him. Will you turn to God? Will you turn to Him? When I was a boy, I liked to play with ants. Now, I was just a little tiny kid, and uh, Dad, we were living there in Littleton, Colorado. And I remember going out on the front porch there, and the sun would shine, and these little tiny, tiny ants were there. And I didn't want to smash them, and I didn't want to hurt them, but I would put my hand in front of them, and I'd put my hand in front of them, and those ants would go this way and go that way, and they'd go every which way. I just wanted not to stop them, but I wanted them to crawl up on my hand. And my friends, God often asks you to do impossible things. Not to humiliate you. Not to put you down. But simply so that you crawl up onto Him. That your dependence is on Him alone. Will you turn to Him? Even right now, with this great problem before you, will you turn to Christ? Will you stop depending on maybe, maybe you're exceptionally smart. Maybe you're attractive. Maybe you're wealthy. Maybe you've got a big network. Maybe you've got a strong will. Maybe you've got, I don't know, we've all got stuff. We've got things. It'll never do. It was never supposed to do. The answer is God. The answer is Him. Exodus 33, 13, our verse says that God gave His grace so that we could know Him. And if you will get to know God this year, you'll be blessed. Say, now where's the plan? Where's the plan? Here's the plan. Here it is. We get to know God. How do I do that? Scripture memorization, daily devotions, personal worship, public worship, disappointments. I trust God anyways. And I want to get to know Him more. And I want to get to know Him more. Oh, that my ways would please the Lord. Oh, that I would know the ways of God. Would you stand with me with your head bowed and your eyes closed? Basically, I'm telling you this. God is interested in developing a relationship with you. Rules, roles, and common goals. And as you learn those, you get to know His character, not just His creation. And all of a sudden, the power of God rises up underneath you and carries you, propels you forward. Father, we come before you, each one of us thinking now of something impossible with great walls before us. And Lord, we trust you. And we can echo the Scripture with God. All things are possible. Lord, would you move in our heart? Help us to trust you this year. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, maybe you're here today, you've, you've never repented of your sin. You've never said, God, I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for what I've done and who, my, who I have become. That's the first step. Would you do that right now, right where you're at? God, I'm sorry I said that, I thought that. My willfulness here, my wrong desires there, I'm sorry. And Lord, I've got these habits. God, I'm sorry. 
and now put your faith and trust in Christ. And say, God, I believe. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe He died for me. I believe He shed His blood to save me from my sin. And oh God, save me right now. Lord, this is almost too wonderful to believe that You, my Creator, actually want a relationship with me. But Lord, Your Word says it. And Lord, I, I want to begin that relationship right now by repenting of my sin and putting my trust in Jesus Christ. And I'm doing it right now. And I'm saying, God, save me. God, save me. Would you say that? God, save me. God, save me. Help me to follow you and know more about you every single day. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song. This is a song of invitation. It's a prayerful song. It's a song of victory. It's called, I Surrender. Now, we think of surrendering as losing, but when you surrender to your Creator, the gracious God, that's how you win. Tori, would you lead us in this prayerful song? All to Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live I surrender all I surrender all All to Thee, my blessed Savior I surrender all All to Jesus I surrender can take me Jesus take me wonderful prayer. I've prayed it. I've sang it numerous times. Well, happy anniversary, Graceway. Got a special gift here for you. It's uh, just a little notebook. It's very nice. Um, it's got some good stitching and our logo there embossed on the front. And I want to present that to you. And our logo is, is special to me. It's, of course, the Capitol building. And then there's these two stripes here. And maybe you thought it was this or that. Actually, it's a picture of you and God. It's a picture of you and God walking, living, existing here at the Capitol. That's what it is. It's God's grace way. You walking with God every day, in every trial, in every situation, in every impossible thing. Brother Joe and... Come on, guys, let's pass these out if you would. And Thank you, guys. I want you to have these. and then I want it to be a reminder. It's you and God. And when you're feeling alone, you don't need a substitute. You need God. You need God. God is everything He claims to be and so much more. Everything. Trust Him. Walk with Him. Now, this year, we've got five principles, and we're going to be developing those. Uh, Brother Tykert is going to be talking more about some things in our next services. But right now, I want you to realize this year, 2024, is going to be a big year for our little church. A big year. And it all depends on God. Now, if you're not paddling in the same direction as God, you need to get that fixed. You're never going to feel the power of the hand of God if you're fighting Him. Stop fighting God. I mean, if you want to fight, fight somebody else besides God. Don't fight Him. 
That's not smart. And God's going to do a great thing, a great thing in your life and in our church. And it will all be for His glory. It's for His glory and our good. Amen. Amen. Brother Joey, would you come close us in a word of prayer, sir? Um, Brother Joey is one of our deacons here, and, and Brother Matt and Brother Butler, these three men. and Brother Matt, would you raise your hand there? Uh, I'm sorry, Brother Kevin. Did I? Oh, Brother Boyle. Yeah. Uh, it is an, uh, an amazing thing to watch the people of God follow the way of God in caring for each other. And if you have a problem, if you have a need, if you have something, we would love to help. We want to make a difference. Brother Joey. Lord, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us. We thank you uh, for pouring out your grace on us when you died in our place at Calvary. I thank you for uh, the atonement that was made on our behalf, Lord, that we learned about in Sunday school. And Lord, I thank you um, for who you are. I thank you for making us in your image, and I thank you for, uh, for making us to, to have fellowship with you, Lord. And I thank you that um, we're never satisfied until we find our rest in you, Lord. I pray that you would help us to find rest in you, Lord. Help us to live in dependence on you. Help us to, um, to grow more and more in Christ-likeness. Um, and I pray that you bless us this week and help us to, um, to grow in grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. God bless you. We'll see you next week.